Well, thank you very much, uh, Dan and Steve. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to be here, and I um, quite enjoy the, the topic that I was assigned. And I, I think um, as we move forward uh, and as healthcare reform uh, comes about, uh, I think this convergence of therapeutic endoscopy and minimal invasive surgery is really going to play a, a very, very critical role uh, going forward. Uh, these are my disclosures um, for all of you to, uh, to look at. Uh, why uh, has there been this convergence of uh, therapeutic endoscopy and MIS? Well, I think it basically bakes, br breaks down into two things. One is uh, developing relationships, and the other are, are tools uh, to do our trade. And I'll try to explain those two things uh, here as I go forward. I think in the beginning uh, was a very uh, uh, important presentation by uh, Tony Kalu and, and Sergey Kansavoy. Uh, they had begun working on a project uh, of uh, transgastric cholecystectomy and transgastric uh, gastrojejunostomy back in 1998. Uh, and over the ensuing uh, two years, uh, and then finally in four years, they presented on uh, a live swine model uh, performing uh, an entire gastrojejunostomy in a swine model using a flexible endoscope. And that really began this, um, uh, this convergence, I think, of minimal invasive surgery and therapeutic endoscopy. There were people who uh, did both disciplines, uh, but uh, I think this really uh, started uh, 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 in earnest uh, a collaboration between um, uh, therapeutic endoscopy and uh, minimal invasive surgery. That first notes procedure as it was presented uh, fostered a collaboration uh, initially between the ASGE and uh, SAGES. And this brought gastroenterologists and laparoscopic surgeons together uh, on a plane of, uh, uh, of understanding and cooperation that I think has uh, really propelled uh, this convergence. Uh, we now have uh, quite a number of, of uh, organizations worldwide based upon this uh, algorithm that was set up between ASGE and, and uh, SAGES, including uh, Euro Notes, uh, Asia Pacific Notes, Japan Notes, Latin America Notes. And these uh, organizations are, are continuing, at least in their areas of collaboration, and relationships have been established, very deep relationships have been established along the way. It's also caused companies uh, to merge their technologies, and we've seen laparoscopic companies, uh, traditional laparoscopic companies, adopt flexible endoscopic platforms and even uh, uh, begin manufacturing or ac acquiring flexible endoscopic uh, companies. So it's been emergence uh, between physicians and also between companies. From the inception of notes, uh, we uh, developed a white paper uh, that looked at the obstacles that we had for notes. And one of the persistent uh, and most important uh, areas that was brought up every year is the need for a multitasking platform. This, um, in fact, was primarily a request, I think, from uh, minimally invasive surgeons. And I think that this it probably represents um, maybe the, 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 the single most important uh, area of uh, technology development, I think, is going to propel um, this whole discipline uh, forward. There were requirements for this operating platform uh, that were uh, outlined during the course of working group meetings over the years. Uh, it needed to be ergonomic, uh, it needed to provide stability, uh, and most importantly, it needed to provide uh, this area of, co of co uh, triangulation of end effectors. And companies began uh, developing some direct drive systems. Uh, 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 the Endosomerai was developed by Olympus. The Anubiscope was developed by Stortz. Boston Scientific de developed their direct drive endoscopic system. But as we looked at those and we looked at um, their usefulness and the ability to use them, they've all fallen by the wayside uh, uh, as, as time has gone on. But um, there are some advantages to a robotic system. Uh, those include a, a high payload and dexterity. Triangulation is easily achieved. It's intuitive, uh, particularly for minimally invasive surgeons. Uh, it has a short learning curve, potentially, and it's capable of force feedback, haptics, and uh, telesurgery. So as we've moved on from these direct drive systems, we're now seeing the emergence 
of, robo of flexible endoscopic robotic systems. And the one that I will uh, just show you today has uh, been developed in Singapore. It's called the, the master, uh, master and Slave Transluminal Endoscopic Robot. Uh, this is the way it works currently, uh, where you have a, uh, an endoscope uh, with end defectors that go down through a double channel endoscope. Right now, the endoscope is controlled by one operator, and then you have a second operator uh, at a computer station that is running uh, the, the end defectors. And uh, these are what the, uh, the initial prototypical uh, end defectors look like. Uh, you can see here on the left, you've got a hook knife and a, and a grasper. Here's a, a closer up view. And um, this is uh, what is happening now. Uh, this is the early prototype. Uh, this is, uh, was done in Hong Kong. But you can see here is the, uh, the, the master uh, running the uh, computer. You have here a second operator who is running the scope. And here we have a, uh, an, an ESD, an endoscopic submucosal dissection procedure that's being performed on a gastric neoplastic lesion uh, with this uh, robot. And uh, this is the specimen that was achieved. This is the uh, defect in the stomach uh, where the resection specimen was taken from. And the early data was published on this. Uh, Steve and I had the opportunity to write an editorial for this. Um, but if you look here, uh, particularly at procedural time, if any of you are familiar with the uh, current uh, endoscopic submucosal dissection techniques that the Japanese have pioneered, uh, the length of time for these procedures is quite uh, remarkable. And you can see here that in this first five patients, uh, the operating time or the, the ability to do this uh, endoscopic submucosal dissection was quite reduced. Uh, also, there was a minimal amount of uh, experience on the part of the operators doing these first five patients in terms of their ESD technique. So I think um, in a very, very real and a very, very tangible way, this robotic, these robotic systems, these endoscopic robotic systems may allow operators, particularly I think minimally invasive surgeons, to start doing sophisticated resections within the gastric lumen or the intestinal lumen in general uh, uh, quite, uh, quite easily. I think it's going to be an enabling technology. I think it's going to allow a change in the site of service. And I think it's going to potentially lower costs in terms of our resections and it leads to a whole plethora of endoluminal techniques uh, that I think will open up uh, to uh, uh, therapeutic endoscopists as well as minimal invasive surgeons. I think the first notes procedure uh, that will come about um, is uh, actually a transanal colon resection. That's my prediction. Currently it's done by this laparoscopic system, but I would predict that in the future uh, we will have a robotic systems uh, that will be able to do this procedure uh, and will um, uh, will make it actually easier, quicker, and uh, uh, and 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 hopefully better outcomes as well. Uh, for a long time, we asked for suturing devices, um, and we now have a, a readily available, I think, uh, easily usable endoscopic suturing device. This is manufactured by Apollo Endo Surgery. It can do interrupted sutures. It can do running sutures. Um, it has grasping devices, um, and it's a very intuitive system, particularly for minimally invasive surgeons who are used to passing the needle back and forth. There's a, 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 a needle a grasper that comes through here, and you simply uh, pass this needle off between the needle driver and this receptacle here. It's a very intuitive system and one that is uh, now uh, finding uh, increasing use. It can be used in a closure of perforations. It can be used in the closure for notes procedures, for management of ulcer bleeding. It's being used a lot now in fistula closures. It's being used for endoluminal obesity treatment uh, and also for complications of bypass surgery where you need stomal or pouch reduction. So uh, a universal uh, suturing device, an endoscopic suturing device, and an example of a tool that we have um, uh, to put in the hands of uh, minimally invasive surgeons or therapeutic endoscopists. We also requested a closure device and uh, these are increasingly coming about. Uh, the one that I will show you is uh, called the Ovesco uh, clip. Uh, it's, a, it's a nitinol memory metal clip uh, that is uh, 
forcibly opened and put onto the end of a cap. It has a string here uh, that goes to uh, this wheel that's mounted on the biopsy channel of the scope. And if you twist this wheel, it pulls on the, on the, um, on the thread here and basically forces this clip off of the end of the, uh, uh, of the cap. And when it's forced off the cap, it assumes its original uh, shape, uh, which is uh, shown here in a clip. And this is how it uh, is shown uh, to work uh, in a, uh, a device. And here I want to show you uh, an, a real-time example of this. Um, uh, this is a case uh, actually that I did. This is a, uh, an adenoma uh, in the uh, duodenal bulb. Uh, we use our usual technique of uh, submucosal injection. Uh, I use a, a material called volvulin, which is a plasma expander. Uh, it's mixed with a little bit of indigo carmine. And I thought that I had a good lift here. Uh, I thought that the, uh, the lesion lifted very well. Uh, and uh, then I went about, went about the process of putting a snare around this. And you can see me seating this snare uh, around it. And um, we're going to move forward here just a little bit. There's a snare. Oh, sorry. Uh, there's a snare around it. If I can go back. Uh, all right. So there's the snare around it, um, and now I'm uh, coming through with what I thought was a, a superficial, uh, 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 superficial grasp of this um, of this polyp, uh, and you'll see here I sort of spoiled the drama of it all. Uh, but um, uh, when I came through uh, with this lesion, uh, you'll see that I have a clear perforation um, in the duodenal bulb. Now uh, I collected myself. Uh, I called Steve. Uh, and had him come by, and um, uh, you can see here that it's a, a full thickness perforation. So now I've, uh, I've got this Ovesco clip, uh, and uh, we're getting in position to, uh, to use this clip. Uh, the original uh, device that I chose to use was some grasping forceps, which can grasp both sides of, um, of this. But as it turned out, um, the, uh, the clip was deployed a little bit to the right. Uh, we only, oops, sorry. So I, I got uh, only part of this uh, closed with, with one clip. And uh, after deploying that clip uh, and re-looking at it, uh, here you can see some of the, the defect here. But after deployment of this clip uh, and re-looking, uh, we found that, um, that there was still some, uh, uh, some closure to be done. So here is, uh, is the remainder of this, uh, uh, of this defect, of this perforation. And here we're deploying a, a second clip. Uh, we aspirate the tissue uh, into, the, into the cap. And you can see the clip mounted on the, um, on the, um, the side of the... Uh, of the cap, and there's deployment of a second clip. Uh, this patient um, uh, basically did not turn a hair. Uh, she uh, was obviously admitted to the hospital. We looked at her carefully. Her white count remained stable. She was afebrile. Two days later, we got uh, contrast studies uh, with no leak, um, and she went home uh, a couple days later. So I think um, a good example of tools that we now have uh, in this uh, era of uh, therapeutic endoscopy. I think uh, the therapeutic procedures on the horizon uh, include endoluminal treatment of GERD, full thickness resection. I think obesity management uh, will be there. Uh, ESD, but uh, made simpler. Uh, and notes procedures, I also think, will come about uh, in time. The bottom line is that I, uh, I believe that with healthcare reform, uh, with the uh, combination and, and relationships that have developed between minimum invasive surgery and therapeutic endoscopy, with the tools that we're now getting that are coming out of companies uh, that have laparoscopic and flexible, flexible endoscopic uh, kinds of technologies, that the, the opportunities are going to be vast for collaboration of, of, uh, in these procedures. And I think ultimately, uh, you all, as minimally invasive surgeons, I think will um, have tools uh, and the ability uh, to go forward with therapeutic endoscopy. 
So these are my uh, final uh, comments. Uh, the convergence of MIS and therapeutic endoscopy, I think, has been stimulated by the development of NOTES. NOTES should be viewed as a movement toward less invasive therapies and not as a new surgical approach. The MIS therapeutic endoscopy convergence will cause an acceleration in, endo in intraluminal therapies, which I've listed before. I think healthcare reform, which is going to uh, is going to reward uh, good outcomes uh, as well as um, uh, lowering costs, is going to stimulate this uh, combination. And endoscopists and laparoscopic surgeons are now uh, fully engaged. So with that, I'll uh, stop and uh, thank you very, very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Superb skills, superb display of technology, uh, meeting your excellent skills. Um, we probably will take one or two questions per speaker while they're still up here on the podium since we don't have a big panel space. So if anybody would like to ask one or two questions, uh, now's our time. And we also have the uh, messaging system, so feel free to text in your questions. We can see them right here on the, on the panel. Um, I'll ask you one, Rob. Um, these are beautiful tools. Uh, we're all cost constrained. Can you give us some inclination on how to get these um, these types of devices, whether it's the, the, the clips you showed or the suturing device, what kinds of costs are we talking about and, and who pays? Yeah, so I think that's uh, where healthcare reform is going to change everything. So um, as an example of the Vesco clip, uh, right now, is it reimbursed? No, it's not reimbursed very much. But um, in the past, that person would have to go into surgery. And the costs of that surgical uh, operation are going to be much more substantial than uh, using the Ovesco clip. So a healthcare company uh, will, will benefit uh, from this technology. And there won't be any question about paying for it because it will ro lower their overall costs. I think with regards to the robot, uh, Dan, I think it's still it's, um, it's, it's a matter of the healthcare system. And if the robot, which is probably going to cost more than, uh, than other things, can be moved to a new environment out of the OR, then the healthcare system is going to look at the overall cost. And I think that's where maybe the savings will come. Real quickly, and introduce yourself from the microphone, please, with Kevin. Uh, thank you, Kevin Revis, the Oregon Clinic in Portland. Thank you, Robert. Great presentation. And uh, I, I think you point out some really new innovative devices, which we've actually had the privilege of utilizing as well. But I, I want to ask you a question about really what's the first step, and, and that is a bit of a rhetorical statement in the fact that it's really a collaborative relationship between surgery and gastroenterology. Obviously, between you and Steve, you have a wonderful relationship. You have a difficult case, and, and you know, he's going to come and, and join you. Uh, we have the same wonderful relationship with our gastroenterologist, but when I'm giving talks routinely off, surgeons come to me and say, in my hospital, they won't let me touch the scope. What advice do you have for these surgeons in those community hospitals or academic centers uh, to at least uh, basically you know, extend an olive branch or start that discussion in order for these type of technologies to be acquired? Yeah, so the, there's a little bit of echo. So the question is, is in the hospitals where there are those wars, yeah. how do you, yeah. how do you yeah. So, so uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's a really good question. Uh, I think it's going to melt away, uh, to be honest with you, again, with health care reform. Right now, uh, the reason that there is sort of chaos and, and there has to be all this uh, dinkering around is because of reimbursement. Uh, uh, gastroenterologists don't want to lose their business. Uh, surgeons don't want to lose their business. But in the future, um, actually, we're going to be all employees of health care systems. So it's just a, it's simply incumbent upon you as a, as a physician to have the skills and the ability to use the, the technology. And if you have the outcomes and you have the ability to do it, then I think that you're going to have that opportunity to do it. And this idea of, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to send you any patients uh, if you encroach on my endoscopic practice, I, I, I think will melt away um, uh, as, as health care reform comes, comes about. Okay. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you.